Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39, through the end of the chapter. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up, gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor that at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is an incredibly important passage in relation to the series that we are completing today on uh, 1 Peter. As you know, we've been talking about this idea of suffering for doing good. Suffering as a, being a part of the church. We did an overview in week one, and then in the second week, we talked about how important it is for us to know our identity in Christ, to know who we are, and to know whose we are, because our natural activity, the way that we live, we live out of our identity. If we understand who we are and whose we are, it will cause us to live differently. Peter's addressing the Gentile Christians. He wants them to more fully embrace their bloodline with Christ as strangers in a strange land. In weeks three and four, we did a two-part on suffering. One on actually suffering for our righteousness. And then we talked about some additional benefits of suffering for the cause of Christ. And this week, we want to talk, as we close out that book, at the tail end of chapter 5, this idea of being in a divine minority. A greeting from the, the church in Babylon comes to uh, this church, the churches through Peter. And it's an overt reminder of the plight of the Gentile Christians. Now, recall, we too are Gentile Christians strangers in a strange land. So this message that Peter is giving to the churches throughout this region applies so directly to us. And there toward the end, there are just a few verses at the end of chapter five. It's a good thing that we had two sermons today because this one's shorter than normal. <laughs> but there are just a few verses at the end of chapter five. And the first is a prayer for strength. A prayer for strength that Peter is bestowing on the church. And he says in verses 10 and 11, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Remember, he is saying, you, God has called you out. He has invited you to be a part of his family. He has chosen you to be a part of his kingdom. That God, after you have suffered a little while, reminds us that this life on earth is brief but that there will be suffering in this life on this earth. But after you've suffered for just a little while, it's tolerable. He will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That the God who chose you, the God whom you serve, 
in this time of suffering that you are going to have on this earth, he is going to restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. It is a prayer for strengthening from the one and only God to his people. And then he says to him, to God, be the power forever and ever. Amen. Prayer doesn't, Peter does not want the church, the Gentile church that he is speaking to, he doesn't want us to forget this deep connection that we have with the God of the universe. And that that very same God who created everything specifically chose them and you and me to be a part of his family to be a part of his kingdom. And as such, what comes with that is his fatherly protection and comfort, his fatherly restoration, his fatherly, fatherly comfort, his fatherly strength and steadfastness. And he calls the church and he calls you and I to stand as firm as we possibly can in the strength of God, despite and in the midst of our struggles our difficulties, and our suffering. He goes on, and I mentioned that he sends a greeting from the, the church in Babylon. This goes back to the fact that, remember we talked about how the, throughout this book, Peter is reflecting back to the exiles of Egypt, the ones that were in, sold into slavery and that were brought out of slavery and into the promised land. And he keeps making this connection between this Old Testament reality and their New Testament reality, this fact that God has called them as strangers in a strange land into the kingdom of God, into the promised land. Yes. And he refers here to this church in Babylon. It's she who is in Babylon is the next couple of verses. Chosen together with you, send you her greetings. So what's this Babylon thing got to do with anything? Again, this is a, another reference back into the Old Testament language. And Babylon basically stands for any archetype. It's an archetype that is synonymous with any and all corrupt nations. So this is the church that's actually in Rome, the center of the Roman government, the center of the oppression that they are feeling throughout all of the region. And that church, that church sends her greetings. And not only her greetings, but Peter is linking them together, realizing that we are a part of the universal church. You're not alone in your own little location, but the church, she in Babylon is sending her greetings and you were chosen together. Everyone in the worldwide church that God has called to be a part of his kingdom is together. She who is in Babylon chosen together with you, send you her greetings. And so does my son, Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love and peace to all of you who are in Christ. So Peter has just talked about the sufferings that come as being a part of a, being a follower of Jesus Christ. And now he is knitting together the larger church that's bigger than just this one little location and saying, you're part of something bigger. You're part of something greater. You are a part of this family of God. And when you greet one another, greet one another with a kiss of love and may peace be upon you as a church. We understand that this is hard. Believe me, the church over here in Rome understands that it is hard. And yet they send you their greetings and they want you to realize just how much we are in this together by the power of God through his spirit and by the blood of Jesus Christ. Greetings from the church in Babylon. This is unveiled reference that reinforces the idea that these Gentile Christians continue to live in exile, but they're members of one kingdom the kingdom of God. They are living within the borders of another kingdom, the kingdom of this world, but they are a part of the kingdom of God, and Peter doesn't want them to ever forget that. 
And he's writing to those churches. But again, I just keep coming back to the fact that he is writing to us. That we, an argument could be made, live in Babylon. But we are strangers in a strange world. And we must remember that our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven. It's in the kingdom of God. And so much of that citizenship is a part of our being and a part of our mental understanding of it. And so Peter came at this over and over and over again throughout this particular book. And we came at it over and over and over again. And it has been a part of my messaging throughout my time with us as a church. That we are a part of the kingdom of God. We are kingdom builders. We are kingdom citizens. And we have got to embrace that in our hearts and our minds. We need to understand our identity in Christ. We need to live out of that identity. I've said it a few times, even just this morning. If we can understand that, if we can wrap our hearts and our minds and our souls around that, it will cause us to live differently. This book is not, I understand why people think it's a how-to book. Because there are a lot of do's and don'ts throughout. But that's not the spirit of its intention. It's a how be book. Mm -hmm. It's a how to be a child of God book. It's a being thing, which means it has to go deep into our soul. And I just encourage you all to embrace this reality deep within your soul. First Peter is intended to be a message of hope in the midst of suffering. Do we have any suffering in our lives? That's the message that Peter is giving us. But I want to highlight just a little bit of a distinction, and it's not one of separation. It's one of broader inclusion. Because God is with us in our suffering, no matter its source. But a lot of what Peter is leaning into is suffering that comes from our righteousness. And Jesse mentioned earlier that this gentleman, Scotty, that we prayed for is one of the healthiest per people she knows. So why is something, why is there suffering, you know, doing all the right things and yet still having some major health concerns and issues? And we can do all the right things. We can actually embody this and live the life that Jesus has called us to and suffer for it. That's called persecution. But as we read in Romans chapter 8, even that will not separate us from the love of God. I mentioned to you a while back about the church in Africa. And how this band of, uh, you know, Upper Africa and, and southern, Northern and Southern Africa are doing a little bit better. But there is this band in the center of Africa where the church is really attempting to reach uh, um, a lot of the lost people groups. And there are struggles in getting the church to propagate itself within that arena. There are some that are successful and some that are not. And when I was talking to my contact there, if you'll recall, what separated the two strains of churches the churches that are expanding and multiplying and the churches that are not the churches that are expanding and multiplying are experiencing more persecution and the reason they are they are experiencing more persecution is because they are loving more like jesus which is what's leading to its expansion as the church and this is such a, a, a paradox for us. That how, why, why would I get more pushback and more flack and more ridicule and more persecution if I'm loving better? How, how does that work? 
because we're strangers in a strange land. Because we are children of the kingdom of God living in Babylon. Babylon doesn't want it. We have to understand this. First Peter reminds the church that we should expect hostility because we are a misunderstood divine minority. And you and I have chosen to live under the rule of a different king, King Jesus. The reality is that holding up under the suffering of persecution is actually a gift to you and I. It's a struggle and it's hard, but it's a gift because it offers Christians, you and I, the opportunity to demonstrate a love that is beyond worldly com comprehension. That we might love someone and they lash back in hatred and we continue to love. That is not natural. That is incomprehensible. And there's only one source of such love, Christ Jesus himself. We need to know who we are, and we need to know whose we are. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, what a deep message we need to embrace and understand. Yes. Father, you love us so much. Nothing can separate us from your love. But Father, there is evil in this world. There, is, there are powers that are staunchly against your love for this world and for the people of this world. And when we strive to live as you have called us to live, those powers come against us. And we are going to feel it. There will be suffering and yet, Father, you encourage us by the words of Peter and by your word and by your spirit to be steadfast, to be strong, to hold fast, and to live a life worthy of the calling of Jesus. We pray, Heavenly Father, for strength in that, for wisdom, for knowledge, for comfort. And I pray, Father, for an increased sense of identity as one of your children, and as members of the kingdom of God. We love you and we praise you. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Blessings to you. Thank you for being with us online. It's